So tonight, chapter number 16 of the book of 2 Kings, we're pretty much just dealing with the reign of one king. We're dealing with the reign of Ahaz. Ahaz was a king of Judah, and just prior to Ahaz, we have kings that were um, noted as being kings that had done right in the eyes of the Lord. We had His father was King Jotham. Before that was, um, what was it, similar, Ahaz, Isaiah, and Ahaziah. And um, there had been a few kings already in Jerusalem that had been doing, you know, had been noted as they had did right, which was in the sight of the Lord. Nevertheless, you know, the high places were still there. We saw that phrase popping up regularly. Now we get to a king that's a king of Judah. And the kings of Israel, by and large, were wicked kings. It's rare. I mean, you had Jehu that did right in the eyes of the Lord. And then his sons, they didn't really do right in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, there's a couple, you know, they got worse and worse. And then the last one, you know, did that which is evil, and he was killed uh, pretty quickly and um, continued to have wicked kings on the throne of Israel. But Judah, this is, this is the first one who's being noted in a while that, of, of someone who lived wickedly. So let's look here in verse number one. The Bible says, In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Of course, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, is, is the king of Israel. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God like David his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Yea, and made his son to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. This is why God made such a big deal going all the way back to when they were inheriting the promised land. This is why God made the, the, the decree that you have to wipe them out completely because of the people, the heathen, the Canaanites that lived in the land before they came into the land were extremely wicked. And the gods that they worshipped were satanic and extremely wicked. And they did abominable things. And the way that they worshipped their false gods was by burning their children in fire as a burnt offering unto, unto their false god, their satanic god. And it's extreme wickedness. So they were practicing all of these things. And God did not want there to be a remnant, these people existing, so that they could taint and add that leaven to the children of Israel who are only supposed to know the Lord and worship the Lord because He is the God, He's the true God, and they don't need to be deceived with all this other nonsense and Satanism. But what happened? They didn't utterly destroy the inhabitants of the land. They allowed them to stay, and they, you know, they didn't win all their battles because they weren't trusting in God. And then I think what, what, what I read when I read that is the first time you see, well, they didn't completely destroy them, but they allowed them to stay and they became their servants, like they became their slaves, their tributaries. So they're getting money from them and they're starting to get all the stuff from them. What I believe happened is that the other tribes started to see, oh, wow, you know, having these people around isn't that, ba isn't that bad of a thing because we can use them. We could make, uh, make money off of them. We could use them to do things for, you know, why not have servants? And I think that concept appealed to them even more to let these people live instead of utterly destroy them like God said and went against the commandments of God. And now they end up suffering for it generations later because they stay in the land, they continue to populate, and they become a thorn in the side of Israel and Judah just perpetually because they didn't heed God. And God's decree was to wipe it out, get rid of it altogether, stamp it out and leave nothing. And it's the same thing with the high places, with the idolatry. God wants them to just get rid of all. That's why it keeps coming up time after time. Like they didn't get rid of it. They didn't. And God wants us to just get fully on board. Just get in and get rid of all the garbage and junk and sin in your life. Get rid of all of it. Don't hold on to any last pieces. Because while that one last piece may not be the, your own personal demise, it could be your children's. 
And we see this happen for the kings. They did right in the sight of the Lord. They did right in the sight of the Lord. They did right in the sight of the Lord. But they didn't get rid of the high places. They didn't get rid of the high places. They didn't get rid of the high places. So for a few generations, they're still all right. And now we get to Ahaz. Ahaz was deceived and worshipped in the high places. Ahaz started offering his, passing his children through the fire unto false gods. You let it around long enough and someone's going to be caught up into this stuff. Instead of just getting rid of it to begin with, pull off the band-aid, you know, do it all at once, get rid of all of it and be done with it. But no, that is keep these traditions, keep the wickedness, keep the idolatry, just let it linger. And it festers and festers until it destroys somebody. So unfortunately now we have a king that did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Let's keep reading here. Um, now as a result of his wickedness, Ahaz, and considering that Judah was still a, a pretty good lighthouse for the Lord, right? Samaria, the northern kingdom of Israel, they had gotten backwards all the way back to Jeroboam, the son of Nebad, and they never really fully kind of came back to the Lord. They had a couple of good kings and, and, and a little bit of sway with some of the people there, but by and large, they'd been doing wickedly for a long time, and God, I think, really focused, though, on Judah and the kingdom of Judah being, you know, still, that's where the priests were, that's where they were worshiping the Lord, that's where the house of God was, that's where the temple was, that's where everything was still happening for the Lord. So now, as long as the kings are doing good, you know, he's taking care of them. They're screwing up a little bit, and he's bringing some, some small judgments against them. But overall, they're still being protected. Things are still going all right for them. But now, you've got King Ahaz just doing completely wicked. And, and getting, you know, we're going to read in this chapter, you already heard it read uh, earlier, but, you know, selling off a bunch of stuff, bringing in false uh, gods into the house of God, cutting the brazen, you know, the, the lake and all the other stuff, you know, all the things that were used to worship the Lord, just destroying them, changing them. And God now is going to bring his judgment and it's severe. It's pun his punishment he brings. He's trying to correct them. See, there's a difference between God forsaking the land because he gives them chance after chance after chance. And then at the end of it, he says, fine, nuts to you. You know, now you're really going to be punished as opposed to, you know, you've been doing good, but you need to get right with me. And this is where, you know, when we get wrong in our lives, when God has to correct us, that we're quick to repent. We're quick to get back. Okay, sorry, God, because the longer it takes, and the more you stray, and the harder your neck becomes, and the harder your heart becomes, the worse and the worse and the worse God's punishment is going to get on you. Because if he's not getting through to you, he will make sure he gets through to you. And with the kingdoms, with Israel and Judah, they end up being taken captive and just taken out of their land. And they become the tributaries. They become the ones the, so the slaves and the servants working for the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and are just taken hostage and taken captive. And eventually they're brought back, but, but that was then the severe punishment after everything that was done. But we're not there yet. This is kind of still the beginning of these things coming to pass. So let's keep reading here, verse number five. Wherefore the Lord is God delivered him. So because of this, wherefore, we just read how he burnt incense in the high places, made his sons a pass through the fire. You know, he did all these things. So because of this, the Lord, his God, delivered him into the head, excuse me, of the king of Syria. And they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel who smote him with a great slaughter. So now you've got the Syrians coming and attacking. You've got Israel coming and attacking. And they have no defense. They have no help. Why? Because they turn their back on God. Because they're not listening and obeying and hearkening unto the Lord. So God says, fine, I'm not going to be your defense then. I'm not going to, you know, protect you from these things that come. And actually, we're going to re you read in other areas that... Um, God was actually punishing them. I mean, it was of God that these nations, that Syria and Israel came against them. 
And uh, let's keep reading. Verse number six says, For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah and 120,000 in one day, which were all valiant men because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So look at what happens here. First Syria comes and it says they took away a great multitude of them captives. They took hostages, prisoners of war. They already took away, it doesn't say how many, but a great multitude. A lot of people were taken captive, were taken hostage by the Syrians. And then Israel comes and it says they killed 100, 120,000 men in one day. That's a slaughter. That is a lot of people killed. And not only did, it, did they kill 120,000, it says they were all valiant men. So these were like their veterans. These are people who were good at war. These are, were the strength of their defense and their army. But because they had forsaken the Lord, God said, it doesn't matter how tough you are. You guys think you're tough. You think you're strong warriors. You know, doesn't matter because if you're fighting against God, you're going to lose every single time. And God can make, you know, the weak and even the smaller numbers come in and destroy you because your physical strength means nothing if God's getting involved in the battle. And God did get involved. And that's why it says 120,000 of them died in one day, which are all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. They turned their back on God. Now, if God's willing to do this when these people all turn their back on him, what do you think he's going to do in your life? You're a child of God. These are his people, and this is what we need to understand about this. While this isn't regarding salvation, this has nothing to do with their souls being saved and them turning their back on God, it's the same thing with you. It's not, you know, your salvation doesn't depend on whether or not you turn your back on God. You're already saved. You're already one of his people. But if you turn your back on God as a believer, as being one of his people, he's going to come down on you. He's going to come down on you hard. And we need to remember that. And when things start going bad in your life, the last thing you need to do is turn your back on God and go to church less. No, you actually need to get in church more. You need to get in your Bible more. You need to pray more. You need to do more to get right with God when bad things happen. When you are facing defeats, when you're facing problems, the last thing you need to do is get away and turn even farther. No, you need to get back and get right and get in and stay in quickly. Verse number seven, and Zichri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Maasiah the king's son, and Azrikam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah that was next to the king. So Zichri is a mighty man of Ephraim. Ephraim is part of the northern kingdom of Israel. On top of these other losses they've sustained, on top of the people being taken captive, on top of the 120,000 being killed just in one day, among those that died, it says the king's own son, Maasiah, he died. So the king personally lost one of his sons. Azrikam, the governor of the house, so like the chief person like ruling and kind of running his house, he was also killed. And um, Elkanah that was next to the king, so like his number one guy. He's not only losing a bunch of people of, of the land, of Judah, the warriors, he's also losing, losing those that are real close to him. This is a severe chastening of God. When you look at everything that's happening here, in verse number eight it says, And the children of Israel carried away captain of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So not only did the Syrians take captives, now Israel also took captives, women, children, they took their goods away. So now, I mean, they're really brought low. Judah's brought really low, and this is what God does when he needs to get your attention and you start going the wrong way. And in this case, I mean, it's extremely the wrong way. Extremely. So he, I mean, that's why these severe measures were taken against them. And there's no doubt God is involved in this. None at all. The Bible says that's why God delivered him. That's why they brought, you know, these things happened. Now, keep your place here. Oh, I can't believe I just did that. I just read completely from 2 Chronicles 28 <laughs> in my notes. If you're wondering where, like, where are you going with verse 5, verse 8, you can say something. You don't got to sit there quiet. 2 Chronicles 28, which is funny because in, in my notes, we had just done verse 4 and now I'm on verse 5, but I forgot that the, the passage had changed. So I, all those verses I just read for you about Syria and you know, taking them captive and everything, 
Those were found in 2 Chronicles 28. So keep a finger there because we're going to go back and forth. That's the parallel passage. It's the same story. We're going in order like I always do. I, I keep the events happening in line in chron chronological order. So as we go back and forth between 2 Kings 16, we're also going through uh, 2 Chronicles 28. So pardon me for that, all those verses, 5, 6, 7, and 8 that I just read from 2 Chronicles 28 because we're going to continue reading in 2 Chronicles 28. We're going to look at verse number 9. We're going to see here, which we don't get this from 2 Kings. Obviously, that's why I go back and forth. There's extra insights that we gain from these other chapters. That Israel, even though Israel's wicked, they learn a very important lesson. Because remember, they took, they took 200,000 women, sons, daughters, and they're spoiled and everything else. These are their brethren. You know, children of Israel, you know, they're all children of Israel. They're just divided into two kingdoms, but they're all still brethren. The Lord considers them still brethren. And that's why he sends a prophet in verse number nine to Israel. And he says, the Bible says, but a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand and ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth up unto heaven. So he's saying that, you know, God delivered Judah into your hand because he was angry with them. God was mad at Judah and that's why you won. But he says, you killed them. You, you've slain them in a rage that's reached up to heaven. You went a little bit too far in, you know, destroying your brother. You know, it's one thing to go out there and to beat him in battle and, got, you know, and God's bringing his judgment on him, but you went, you went too far. Verse number 10. And now... So even on top of that, that rage where they killed so many people, now ye purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. But are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? So he's saying now you want to keep them as your slaves. Now you want to bring them into bondage. Your own brethren, you're bringing your own brethren into bondage. Now, the, it, admittedly, there is a difference between the heathen that were supposed to be destroyed being brought into bondage and how God looked at that versus their brethren being brought into bondage. There are two different things. And this definitely is not supposed to be done. And they're doing this so that the, the prophet comes to him and he says, and who do you think you are? Don't you have sins against the Lord? You know, God was angry with them and look what you did to them. You slayed them with the rage that goes to heaven, but now it's time to look at yourselves. Because don't think that this won't happen to you now. The way, you know, with what judgment you meet, it shall be measured to you again. That's what Matthew 7 is talking about. It says, judge not lest ye be judged. Okay, now you're going this far with your brethren. Well, guess what? That's going to come to you now. You better examine yourself. And that's what he's saying. Don't you have sins against the Lord your God? Verse 11, now hear me therefore and deliver the captives again which you have taken captive of your brethren for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Berechiah the son of Meshillamoth, and Jehezekiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Hadlim stood up against them that came from the war. So the prophet is saying, you know, now God's angry with you. You better do something about this. So some of the elders and some of the, the, the heads of the people, they took heed and they listened to the prophet and now they go out to confront the warriors, the, you know, the, the people that came, the army that comes back from the defeat with all of these people taken captive and stuff. And verse 13 says, and said unto them, you shall not bring in the captives hither. You're not bringing those captives here. For whereas we have offended against the Lord already, Ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass. For our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. They had some sense. They said, you're not bringing them here because you're going to make things even worse if you bring those captives here. Get rid of them. God's already angry with us. Don't make them even more angry. It's a good attitude to have. Verse 14, so the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. So they just let them there and say, fine, you deal with it. Right? They left them before the princes they, and they dispersed. Verse 15, And the men which were expressed by name, so the ones we just read about in verse 12, rose up 
and took the captives and with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them. So they had taken these captives out and some of them were even naked. They just, just leading them out, leading them up to Samaria from Jerusalem or from wherever, from Judah. And, and some of them were just naked, you know, in shame, just, just dragging them across the desert or whatever up to Samaria. These guys take them, they clothe them, and it says it shod them. So they put shoes. I mean, think about it. They're walking barefoot. They're walking naked. And um, it says, and gave them to eat and to drink and anointed them. So they washed them up. They cleaned them up and carried all the feeble of them upon asses and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. So they did that, which was right. They did what they were supposed to do. They took care of them. And this is how you're supposed to treat, you know, in the Bible, you'll find in other places too, that's how you're supposed to treat prisoners of war. When you go to battle and you have a war and God hasn't said just to destroy them all and you're actually taking a prisoner of war, that you give them food. You give them something to eat. You don't torture them. You, you, you make sure they're cared for as a person and that's how you deal with them. It's the right thing to do. And then it says in verse 16, at that time did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him. So after he's been um, hurt by the Syrians, after he's been hurt by Israel, um, now he goes and sends unto the kings of Assyria to help. So just keep this in mind. Remember, in case you didn't know, Syria and Assyria are two different nations. And just, sometimes it's hard to, to keep that straight. Sometimes as you're reading, Assyria is different from Syria. Um, it's important to just remember that because they're, they're, they're completely different from one another. Uh, let's go back to 2 Kings 16 now. Now we're going to read verse 5 in 2 Kings 16. So apologize for that. But keep your place in 2 Chronicles 28. We are going to go back to that. 2 Kings chapter 5, excuse me, 2 Kings 16, verse 5. Then Reason, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. At that time, Reason, king of Syria, recovered Elath to Syria, and drave the Jews from Elath, and the Syrians came to Elath and dwelt there unto this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath pileser king of Assyria. So this is where we're kind of catching back up to the story, which is what we read in the other chapter. So Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath pileser king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it for a present. To the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria hearkened unto him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it, and carried the people of it captive to Ker and slew reason. And king Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And king Ahaz sent to Urijah the priest the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the workmanship thereof. And Urijah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Urijah the priest made it against King Ahaz came from Damascus. Now, so obviously what happens here, he hires Tiglath Pileser, the, the king of Assyria, to go and fight a battle. He's like, hey, you know, I'm getting destroyed here. He says, I'm your servant. I'm your son. You know, just giving obeisance to Assyria and saying, you know, you're my boss. You're in charge, but come and help me out. Here's a bunch of money. So he takes silver and gold out of the temple of, of the Lord and out of his own treasures and just sends him a bunch of money. So king of Assyria goes, okay. So he goes up and gets involved in the battle and he fights against the Syrians, and he takes Damascus. So he just takes over Damascus, takes a bunch of captives for himself, and then he's done. And while he's still there in Damascus, Ahaz goes up to meet him. He ought to go to talk to him then. He, he won his victory, so Ahaz goes up to talk to him. And while he's there, he sees this altar in Damascus. And he decides, wow, look at that altar. I want one of those. So he gets the measurements of it, describes it all, and sends it back to Uriah the priest and says, hey, build me one of these. This is what we need. Build this for me. And he does it. Uriah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent. 
he replaces the altar that they, now the altar that they had in Jerusalem was the altar that was built after the heavenly altar, right? Remember when, when even when Moses and the tabernacle was made, it was made after those things that were patterned in heaven. And then after that, they built the temple, right? And they still had this altar. And these are things that were given to them from God. That this is the way that it needs to be done. And he, he trades the good, right, godly altar for some wicked, heathen, satanic altar, thinking that that's somehow better. This just shows how backwards he was. And, and he changes, he replaces the altar pattern of heavenly things with an altar of the wicked. Let's keep reading. I'm going to get into this a little bit more in just a minute. Verse 12. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar. And the king approached to the altar and offered thereon. So he had sent ahead of time to have it created. He gets back and he sees it and he's like, oh, great. My altar is ready for me to use. And uh, he, he, off makes, he, he makes an offering on that altar, verse 13, and he burnt his burnt offering and his meat offering and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings upon the altar. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Peace offerings, pour out his drink offering, offer his burnt offering, his meat offering. What's he doing? He's retaining certain aspects of the way that God told them to worship and the offerings God told them to make and he's merging that in with this wicked heathen altar. So he's completely mixing these two religions and coming up with his own. He's thinking, well, I like this out of my religion, and I like this, and I like their altar, and I'm just going to come up with my own thing. And unfortunately, people are doing this all the time. They like to pick and choose. They say, well, I like this part out of God's word. I think we'll keep that. I like this part of God's word, but I'm just going to reject all the rest of this stuff. And what you do with that is you come up with your own God. You're making up your own God in your own mind. Because I'll tell you what, the same God that, that gave us Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, you know, the law and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all these books that, that a lot of people don't want to read at all and they don't want to hear that at all, it's the same God that gave us Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, the Gospels and the Good News. It's the same God. Amen. We need to accept all of it. Jesus Christ is the Word of God made flesh. When you start changing and picking and choosing the aspects that you want or you don't want, you're changing Jesus. It's a different God. It's a different Jesus. We need to take it all. You can't just pick and choose what you like and what you don't like. This happens all the time. Verse 14 says, And he brought also the brazen altar which was before the Lord from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the altar. And King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, Upon the great altar burn the morning burnt offering and the evening meat offering and the king's burnt sacrifice and his meat offering with the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their meat offering and their drink offerings and sprinkle upon it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire by. So there's so many things he kept the same. Now part of that may be, and again, I don't know, it could just be completely all out of his own mind that he wants to do things this way, or it could be a way to get people to just accept this stuff because it's not all different. He's keeping all of this stuff the same. And remember, that's the same thing that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, did. He was worried about them going down to Jerusalem and worshiping there the right way, the way that God said, the place where God put his name there, and he didn't want them to do that. So he made these two golden calves and set them up and said, okay, these be your gods. This is where you're going to worship. But he didn't change all the feasts. He didn't change all the offerings. He just said, well, this is where you're going to do it, and these are your gods, and this is what you worship. But everything else you can still do the same. Because you don't want to make this great departure into something completely different because the people aren't going to go for that. But when you change a little bit, they say, well, we're still worshiping the Lord. We're still bringing our sacrifice. It's not that big of a deal. We know that these, I know he said these things, we know these things aren't our gods, but we'll just do this anyways. The king said so, and they compromise. And it doesn't take very long before their children and their children, they're just worshiping these idols now. And that is their gods. And this is what he does here. He changes a religion 
And you know, this type of thing has happened quite a bit too for getting people to, to uh, change religions instead of doing it the right way. The right way is you give them the truth and they repent. They change their belief. And you say, no, you've got it all wrong. You've got it all backwards. Your religion's false. It's wrong. So if you're trying to convince someone who believes in Hinduism, no, you, you've got it all wrong. Your religion is just false. You need to just stop believing in that stuff and put your faith in Christ. That's the way, that's the true way you get someone to convert to just the true religion. They have to change their minds and say, yeah, I don't accept this stuff anymore. I'm just going to believe in Jesus. But other people might come along and say, well, we need to make this Jesus thing a little bit more palatable to them. So we can teach that, well, yeah, there is reincarnation. You know, I mean, because the resurrection is like a reincarnation, you know, and, and you could start doing all these things to try to merge the religions and say, this will make it easier for them to accept if we tell them, you know, there's, there's more than one God. Or we tell them, you know, and it's, you're just lying. And you're not even going to get true converts because now you've just made up your own God and your own religion. This is actually what happened also even in, within Christianity. You think about there's uh, during the, the early parts of the history in the United States, as there were many slaves brought over from Africa, well, most of the people in Africa had a wicked, heathen, you know, voodoo type of religion. And now, even to this day, down south, there's many, you know, this is where a lot of the charismatic stuff came from. And the, it's very, I'm not going to go into all the details, but when you start lining up some of, the, some of the things that some of these charismatic churches do in the south, it so lines up with the voodoo religions and the weird, wicked, heathen religions of Africa because they merged. Because people as, Christi as you know, Christianity being the main religion in the United States, and the acceptable religion, people look down upon, really, I mean, factually, if, if you're not Christian, I'm sure, you know, for, for a long time, especially when it was way more dominant. And I mean, now people are losing their religion and losing Christianity and don't care about it anymore. But for a long time, it, I mean, it, it was pretty solid. So to mingle in and to join in, they, they kind of took, well, we like this about Christianity. We could call ourselves Christian and then retain all this other witchcraft and wickedness in our religion. So what they do in the voodoo religion, oftentimes when they want to speak with the spirit world and stuff like that, they play their music, they get themselves kind of hyped up a little bit in a frenzy, and they use the music, and sometimes they use the drugs or whatever to then communicate, and they have their own you know, possession, demon possession and things that go on, and they think they're dealing with the spirit world. Well, that's not that far removed from the Pentecostals that they start playing their music and they play it loud and they get over and over and you got someone hyping up the crowd and getting them into the same type of state that where they're demon possessed and they're rolling on the ground and they're speaking all kind of jibber jabber and everything else and communicating essentially with the spirit world. They call it the Holy Spirit, but it's the spirit of the devil. Amen. And when you start looking at them side by side, you say, wow, they really did just kind of merge so much of those religions together and they just came up with their own. And it's not of God. They've made their own God and they've made their own Jesus. A Jesus that doesn't really save because you don't get eternal life through their religion. You get temporary life. And you have to be possessed to show that you're saved in their religion. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. So he sees the altar, he commands every, okay, we're going to be doing all the, all the sacrifices, all of our offerings, everything is going to be on this altar now. Verse 16, thus did Uriah the priest, according to all that King Ahaz commanded. Now, shame on Uriah the priest, for if anyone should know better, it's the priest. Remember when Isaiah thought he was something special and he wanted to go in and offer up his incense? And the priest said to tell him, no, Isaiah, you've gone too far. Get out of the house of the Lord. And God smote him with leprosy. Well, now you've got your eye just saying, sure, I'll build a different altar for you. No integrity, no backbone. Do whatever you say, king. And look, I don't care if the king would have killed him for not listening. 
He needs to say, I am not going to build a fall, uh, an altar under some false god. We're not going to change the altar of the Lord. We're not going to do it. Or I'm not going to do it. If you want to do it, you find someone else to do it. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, you know, I mean, they're not going to bow down to the golden image. I don't care what you do to me. It's just something I'm not going to do. It's a line I'm not going to cross. Shame on your eye to the priest. Verse 17, And King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases and removed the labor from off them and took down the sea from off the brazen oxen that were under it and put it upon a pavement of stones and the covert for the Sabbath that they had built in the house and the king's entry without turned he from the house of the Lord for the king of Assyria. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaz, which he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Ahaz slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David and Hezekiah his son reigned in his stead. And you see here how it says he turned, and it says the king's entry without, like on the outside of the, of the house, he tur turned he from the house of the Lord for the king of Assyria. Why? Because he became the king of Assyria's son not God's son. He is relying in man and relying in this king instead of relying in the Lord for his, for his strength and for his deliverance and for his security. And what did that get him? Nothing. Way worse, actually. A huge punishment, a huge chastening. Flip back, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 28 now because that finishes off chapter 16 here in 2 Kings. 2 Chronicles 28 We'll get verse number 22. The Bible says, in the, in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that king Ahaz. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. And in every several city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. Now, what another stupid mindset that he had. Just like, I forget who the other king was that did this. He goes to the gods that can't save. When he went to Damascus, the king of Assyria had just defeated the Syrians. He sees an altar in Damascus that was an altar for the Syrian people, not the Assyrian people. They were defeated. Now, they, the Syrians, had defeated him, right? They had done bad to him. They had defeated him in battle. So he's saying, oh, well, their gods helped them to beat me. So now I'm going to go worship and serve them so that they can help me too. Well, they didn't help them against the king of Assyria, did they, dummy? Why are you going to go worship some false god that couldn't even save them from this other king? It's just so deluded. What a dumb, dumb mindset to have. It makes no sense whatsoever. And then, you know, and people have this attitude, too, of looking at their immediate circumstances of things going right or things going wrong and applying that to what's going on in their life spiritually, especially someone, you know, maybe they're trying to find a good church or a right church or something and say, oh, well, I went to this church and everything was going good. You know, I was, I went every time, as long as I went to the Catholic church, everything was going good. And as soon as I went to that Baptist church, man, everything went bad. So now I'm just going to go back to that Catholic church because that just must be the right church. Instead of saying, no, you've got it backwards. Maybe there's a reason why everything's going bad is because someone doesn't want you in the right place. They're fine when you're in the wrong place. And in this case, it was, you look at the, the, the gods did not help the Syrians, because it's a false god, and you, the reason why everything's going so bad for you is not because you have the wrong god, it's because you're going against the right god. That's the whole point. And it, just, it just doesn't even occur to him. 
But he goes up there to meet with the king of Assyria. He sees the altar that the Syrians use and decided to worship their God. Makes no sense. Turn, if you would, now to Isaiah chapter 7. We've got a little bit of time. I, I was going to cover this if we had enough time, and we do. Because this is, we're, we're in a time now in the book of 2 Kings, getting real, you know, pretty close to the end of the book. We've got like you know, nine chapters left or something like that. And um, this is the time where it's pretty much ramping up to them being taken captive, going into captivity. And this is also a time when there's a lot of scripture being revealed. It's a pretty exciting time. You look at just the history of God's word being revealed and you have, you know, the books of Moses, which obviously happened during, um, right, you know, during their captivity, right before, the, you know, Moses is going to lead them out or actually right after Moses leads them out, you know, during that time frame. And then you've got the time of the judges and, um, you know, of course, Joshua going into the promised land. And we get these records of the kings. You got first and second Samuel, first and you know, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, you got all these things that are just kind of giving us the information. But the prophets of God really coming out, and you know, you had Elijah and Elisha. There's but there's a, a, a long time frame, you know, a time of the judges about four hundred years, times of the kings, you have four hundred you know, you've got you've got a really long time frame where all of these events are taking place. And not a lot of prophets overall within that whole time frame. But now you have getting real close right before their captivity. And, and literally in this time frame, you have Isaiah, you've got Hosea, you've got Micah, and you have Amos all definitively preaching during this. And when I say this time frame, it may or may not include Ahaz specifically, but it, it's this, this time frame we're getting into. Okay, and, it, and it's getting near with, with Ahaz and Hezekiah and, you know, with, and some with Jotham and Isaiah. So like this is the getting near the end and you've got all these prophets now coming. And the reason why is because God is warning. God's warning them. He's giving them ample opportunity to repent and to get right. That's the whole purpose that he sends his prophets. He's saying, look, judgment's coming. Destruction's coming. You're going to be taken captive. Get right. Get right. You know, and, and had the people listened, they could have gotten right and avoided the captivity until it got to the point where it gotten too far. But what's interesting is that you see all, you know, many of the, um, the major prophets, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all are within pretty much the same time frame between right before with Isaiah, them being taken captive, with Jeremiah and Ezekiel, them being taken captive and in the captivity, and then coming out of captivity with Ezra and Nehemiah, and then you have all the minor prophets, then, you know, like after those books, which many of them were speaking in the time while the kings were still in the reign, and many of them are during the captivity and just after the captivity. So, like, all of these books of the Bible wrapping up kind of the Old Testament are almost all being done in a relatively short period of time. It's kind of interesting, right? Because then you have a really long period of time between Malachi and Jesus Christ before with, with pretty much nothing being revealed by God until the New Testament. And now with Revelation, of course, everything has been revealed as far as scripture goes. So, anyhow, I just kind of wanted to point that out. It, 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 it's, it's good to know these things, to get it in context of the overview of the Bible. So, when you are doing your personal reading, and now you, maybe you get into the Minor Prophets, you get into all these, these sections, you're in a different part of the Bible than we are on Wednesday night, keep that in mind that a lot of the judgments that you're going to see them, you know, um, you read the burden of whoever, the burden of Moab and all these places are taking place during the time that we're in right now in the book of 2 Kings, during these reigns. So you, could, you can put the events together and they'll make a little bit more sense and be a little bit more clear to you about everything that's going on 
in the world of Israel, you know, during this time frame. And it also helps to give you a little bit better understanding of why God does the things he does and, and just understanding it all. So keep that in mind. It's really good to do these types of studies to, to, to know when in time all these prophets are, are given their prophecies. Even if they're giving a lot of prophecies like Isaiah does of future events, he's still speaking to them at that time. Much of it is future prophecy, but much of it is also short term. Joel, the same thing. Much of that is future end times prophecy, but, but a lot of it's still applied to the time as well. They're, they're, they're giving these dual prophecies because they're for the people at the time as well as for us and for the future. So um, you're in Isaiah chapter 7. This is during a time, and we're going to get through as much of this chapter as I think we can with the time that we have. This is all during the days of Ahaz, as verse number 1 says. The Bible says, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. Right? Exactly where we're at. That reason the king of Syria and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. So what does that mean? They got scared. Their hearts moved. Just like, you know, you see the trees swaying in the wind, you know, wind blows. They are really uncomfortable because they find out, hey, Syria and Israel have hooked up. They've joined up and they're coming after you. They get wind of this. They're confederate together. So they get tossed about with the wind instead of relying on the rock. Verse number three. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. Thou and Shear Jashub thy son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Now, we don't get any of this information from reading 2 Kings or 2 Chronicles. The prophet Isaiah goes to meet with Ahaz. God sends Isaiah before they come and attack. He gives them a warning. So now, you know, having already read the judgment of God against Ahaz, isn't it even more justified knowing that God had sent Isaiah to go already to talk to Ahaz when, he, when he's already moved and he already is unsure and he doesn't know what to do, that God literally sends a prophet to him? Because God's trying to get through to him. God wants him to trust in him. So he gives them, he gives him a messenger to tell him what's going on. Verse number four, and say unto him, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah. So he says, you don't have to be afraid. He gives him an opportunity for God to fight for him. For God to defend him. You don't have to fear. I know you're worried right now, but don't fear. And he names them. Don't worry about these two. Verse 5, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. The word of God came to him saying, it's not going to happen. It's not going to And if you remember from the other chapters that we read too, when they came against them, yeah, they defeated them, yeah, they had taken captives and stuff, but they still didn't completely, you know, set up a king and completely take them over. They devastated them, but it didn't, it, they didn't actually succeed because the word, of the word of God still stands. But had he listened and trusted in him, it wouldn't have been nearly as bad. They, they would have gotten the victory instead of suffering a loss, but not a total loss. Verse number eight, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. So he's giving him and Judah, the king of Judah, the inside intel on what's going to happen to Israel. He's saying 65 years, 
Ephraim's going to be broken. They're not even going to be a people anymore because they're going to be taken. Because God's already got judgment coming against them because of how wicked they've been. Verse 9, And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. And isn't that the truth? If you will not believe, you will not be established. God wants our faith. If you put your faith in God, you are established, you are on a rock, you are firm, and, and the winds and the threats and anything that comes against you, you can stand solid. But you have to have faith. And when you don't have faith, you get scared. And when you get scared, you make the wrong decisions. And you run and try to find help anywhere you could find it instead of having faith in the, the, tr in the rock and the defense of the Lord. Verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake... And you know, this reminds me because I wanted to um, bring this up with, from 2 Chronicles 28. It says, um, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. They, ruin, they literally ruined him. By him going and relying on some other false gods, he hears from the prophet of the Lord. He hears from Isaiah. He decides not to trust in him, but goes after these other gods, and it ruined him. It destroyed him. It completely ruined his entire life and the lives of many, many, many other people. They were the false gods were the ruin of him. False religion will be the ruin of you. That's why I'm going through my series and exposing all these various cults because it's ruining so many lives. So many people get deceived by this stuff and they end up throwing away an entire life to some false god, to some merger of a heathen god with a Christian god or whatever the case may be. Just people making up their own Jesus, making up their god man who's not really a god and, and worshiping people and following after a man and not after the Lord. And it's going to be their ruin. Isaiah 7, look at verse number 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Now, how much more can you ask for? He's saying, look, just believe. And then he says, what sign do you want? What sign do you want to prove that this is going to happen? The, king, the, the, the gods of Syria, of Damascus, weren't offering that. Especially after they got defeated by the Assyrians. He's confronted with Isaiah saying, look, what sign do you want? You could ask whatever you want. And look what his, his response is. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. He didn't want to know what's right. And look, he says, well, I'm not going to tempt the Lord. The Lord is the one that said, you know, ask of me a sign. You're not tempting God when he asks you. When he, you know, if he's asking you, then he's asking you. He's not, he's not doing it for no reason. You know, it's, oh, I'm not going to tempt God. I'm not going to tempt the Lord. You know, I'm not going to test him. Yeah, you're not going to test him and you're not going to believe him either because you don't believe him. No, you ought to test things. He already decided not to believe the Lord. But here he has his opportunity and he says no. And this makes God angry. Verse number 13. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Say, now who do you think you are? You're going you're gonna to wear out God? You're going to make him weary or tired by asking something of God? You know, you're already wearying men. Now you think you're going to make God weary? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now what a great sign that is. What a great prophecy. And again... He wasn't a believer. And he's telling him a prophecy about a Savior. Ahaz didn't believe. He didn't want to hear it from the Lord. He wasn't even willing to see a sign. And he says, well, here's a sign. There's going to be a Savior born, born of a virgin. Another opportunity to believe. I mean, he basically got the gospel. Butter and honey shall he eat that, ye may, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, 
the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. He's saying basically before Christ is born, you know, this is the, the land is going to be forsaken. You know, those that you hate. You hate Israel. You hate um, Syria. Because they're, they're already going to be destroyed. They're going to be gone. That was his sign. But he chose not to believe it. Verse 17, The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely, by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. Now, what is he talking about here? He's talking about um, the, you know, the, the razor coming upon them. And basically what he's saying, when it's going to get their hair and their beard and you know, off their feet, it's bringing them to shame. That when, when they get all their hair cut off like that, he say, it, the, the whole reference is they're going to be brought to shame by the king of Assyria. Assyria is going to destroy them. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep, and it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall, um, that they shall give. He shall eat butter, for butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings, it shall even be for briars and thorns. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns, and on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen for the training of lesser cattle. Now, we're going to stop there. We, we've, we've done enough tonight. We're kind of out of time. But you can keep reading in chapters 8 and chapters 9 and chapter 10, all the way through chapter 14 in Isaiah. And a lot of it's going to be prophetic, but a lot of it is still, this is the time frame of Ahaz going all the way until chapter 14 is when chapter 14 in Isaiah is when he dies. So keep that in mind. It's just, it, you'll get some more stuff out of it and you'll see a little bit more information. Like, you know, if we didn't read here in Isaiah, you wouldn't have even known that God sent Isaiah to King Ahaz to give them more warning and to ask a sign and all of these opportunities that he had to get right with God and just believe him and he chose not to, so utter destruction came against him. I mean, he got chastened hard of the Lord for his stiff neck and just refusing to believe. And your life is going to, if you choose to just work against God and not listen to God, your life is going to be difficult like it was for Ahaz. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all of your long suffering and mercy and the chances that you give us, dear Lord, and for you sending, I believe, prophets into our own lives to, that we could hear your word preached and expounded to us, dear Lord. Help us to hearken unto your words and to take them seriously and, and not, to, um, not to backslide, not to, to refuse to hear and, and not want to listen, Lord, but help us to have the right spirit that we'd be motivated to to do more, to listen more, and to, to change whatever needs to be changed in our lives, to be more conformed unto your words and to, and to have the obedience. God, help us to get all the, whatever the traditions and the high places and the things that maybe aren't even bothering us that much, but they still are there. Help us to make a big purge in our own lives, to, to get cleaned up, God, especially for the sake, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of our children and for their children, that we don't just let things that are wicked remain, that they can fester and just be a, a, a cancer spiritually in our lives, dear Lord. Help us to identify these things and remove them, and that we can have uh, full integrity with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.